Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today, I've got an old friend, Dr. Stu Friedman from Wharton University. He's a professor of management, and he was one of my professors about a decade ago. He's a leading expert on leadership development, work-life integration, and an early version of actually being bulletproof. He focuses on measuring and monitoring what you get back for the energy you spend throughout your day, throughout your career, throughout your relationships, and quantifying this, and then using that as a way to tell you how you're doing. He taught me the techniques in his book called Total Leadership, Be a Better Leader, Have a Richer Life, which was published back in 2008. His most recent book, and the reason he's on the podcast today, is called Baby Bust, New Choices for Men and Women in Work and Family. Stu, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Dave. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a good 10 years since we talked, but I was really impacted by your class mm. where you had me sit down with a group of my peers and figure out where my energy was going and what I was getting back for it. Mm -hmm. How many people have been through that program in the last decade, would you estimate? Uh, well, uh, at at the Wharton School, a um, couple thousand, and then in uh, organizations and trade associations uh, around the world, uh, tens of thousands. The book is now in uh, six or seven different languages, and I give talks and workshops all over uh, for government agencies and private and public sector organizations. So uh, not not quite as intensively as in my Wharton course, which, you know, as you know, takes you through every exercise in the book. and. Yeah. Uh, you do a lot of work, uh, really reflecting on what matters most to you, connecting with the people who matter most to you, and then doing these experiments that are designed to achieve what I call the four-way win, improved performance at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself. So even in the short time that I spend with uh, groups, say even just for a couple of hours, uh, I make sure that everybody comes out of that with a, a game plan and a scorecard for what they can do to uh, to pursue a meaningful uh, four-way win in their own lives. I can say it really helped me, and that's probably one of the reasons that the New York Times says that you've inspired rock store adoration from your students. That was, uh, I don't know who said <laughs> that, but, um, you know, th this is a process that uh, we created when I was at Ford Motor Company. Uh, so after 15 years of doing practice, research, consulting, teaching on work-life integration and leadership development, the CEO of Ford Motor Company asked me to join them to help try to transform the culture of that company. So I was the, the, the senior executive responsible for leadership development from 99 to 2001. And our team created a, a method that really helped people to focus on what matters most to them and then to do something about aligning what matters with what they actually do every day. And when you give people a, a, a structured method for doing that and the secret sauce, peer-to-peer -peer coaching, and you started with that, right? You, sat, you said that I sat you down with a few of your peers. Well, that is really the magic, is having yeah. the accountability pressure and the support from peers who are doing the same thing as you are, except, of course, their story is different because it's their story, not your story, but you're helping them and they're helping you. There's magic in that. And... Uh, and by providing an opportunity for people to do that, they get a lot out of it if they put something into it. Yeah, having a, that community and that way of, of getting a read on what's happening yeah. keeps you from deceiving yourself, which is something that I learned about myself I'm pretty prone to do. Well, uh, that's something that is extremely common, which is why coaching and the kinds of things that you provide and the tools that you provide uh, with the, your, you know, the Bulletproof uh, they're all about how you help people to maintain some kind of, you know, accountability, um, you know, to themselves. And, and that is a really, really hard thing to do. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually underestimated, I think, in terms of how, the difficulty of maintaining a commitment to something that you want to do uh, that's a change. It, it also drives you to pay attention to what you're supposed to want to do and what you actually want to do. Because mm. there can be a very big gap between those two, and particularly for men, it becomes sort of like you have a family duty that says you have to do this, but then mm. 
it doesn't create happiness because you keep putting, you know, the, uh, you put effort into that domain, but then you don't get a return for it. And eventually you realize like, it's not happening. My take on your new book on baby bust yeah. is that you may have taken some of what you saw from these coaching people and that inspired you to write the book because you talk about why men and women are opting out of parenthood or why they're not. But I wanted to really focus our interview today yeah. not on the total leadership techniques. And by the way, if you haven't read Total Leadership, buy the book. It's awesome and it has all the yeah. tests you need. But let, let's talk about Baby Bust. What yes. changed with work and family over the past two decades when you've been studying it? So um, in the late 80s, I was inspired by the arrival of my first child to to undertake a you know, systematic research and an exploration of the world of practice to find how people integrate the different parts of their lives for mutual gain and to start research on Wharton students and alumni to find out from them you know, what are their career aspirations? What are their aspirations at home and in the community and for themselves personally? And how do they foresee, you know, their conflicts uh, and, and the opportunities for mutual gain among the different parts? And, you know, just what are their plans and, and their values? And so we wanted to study the life interests as they evolve of Wharton students and alumni. So 1992 is the first year that we started doing surveys, and in 1992, we um, one of the surveys we did was to ask hundreds of questions of the graduating class of 1992, the undergrads, 22-year-old seniors, uh, and 490 or so of them completed this very extensive questionnaire, and then we, we surveyed some other classes, MBA classes, alumni. I wrote some books and articles about this, and then... Went to Ford uh, in the late 90s, came back, focused my attention on the total leadership work. And then as 2012 was nearing the horizon, I uh, be became clear to me that now is the time to, uh, to, to capitalize on this investment we've made long ago in the past by doing a longitudinal study to compare the class of 1992 with the class of 2012 and to ask the members of the class of 1992 to tell us what's actually happened. Uh, with your life so that we could see how what they said actually turned out. So the Baby Bust book, this book right here, uh, is uh, the story of what we discovered when we compared the class of 1992, the Gen Xers at the time of their graduation, with the Millennials, uh, class of 2012 at the time of their graduation. And we also supplemented the surveys with a bunch of interviews, um, including videotaped interviews, which we're going to be um, posting on our website shortly. So what what screamed off the screen when I started looking at, at the results was the comparison between um, the Gen Xers and the Millennials with respect to the question, do you plan to have or adopt children? for which the response alternatives were yes, probably, not sure, probably not, and no. In 1992, 79% said yes. In 2012, 42% said yes. Wow. I thought, no, that can't be right. And it turns out it's right. Um, and so the my focus then became on trying to explain this extraordinary drop in the intentions of people with respect to starting a family with children in it. Uh, and the, the book goes into some detail on why it is that people are much less likely to plan to have kids now. And it's interesting that the reasons for men and for women are quite different. And then the back half of the book is what do we need to do about this from a social policy point of view, from a, an organizational practices point of view, and then from the point of view of the individual and, and families, what do we need? So that's what the Baby Bust book is about. Well, take us through it. What's the mindset for men? And then what's the mindset for women? Like, what are the differences you came across? So, um, you know, it's not all gloom and doom here, I should say. Uh, most people hear this result and they think, well, what's going on? You know, the world is ending. Uh, well, we won't have people taking care of us when we're old. Uh, and indeed, those are real risks. Um, and for both men and for women, the desire to become a parent, the idea of being a parent, the value of parenting in one's life 
is still really, really high. Most people think, well, that, that's a part of life I want to experience. What's dropped is their, their intentions to actually do it because so many don't see how they can. So the key reasons for men are that they anticipate greater conflict between work and their family roles. So they fully expect their spouses to be engaged in you know, careers, uh, much more so than in the past. Uh, they also are um, no longer seeing themselves as the sole breadwinner. The Gen Xers and men, they, they thought of themselves as breadwinners. The current generation of men don't. Right. Uh, they also are interested in being more fully engaged than their fathers were in the work of and the pleasures of, of being a father. Uh, so they, uh, you know, you, you put all those together and add into the mix that both men and women expect to work 14 hours more per week in the class of 2012 compared to the class of 92. That's huge by itself. Yeah, right. So how many hours do you expect to work on average 1992, 58, class of 92, 72? That's insane. Both it, of those, by the way. Uh <laughs> Well, 58 is a little more sane, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So you, you add all that together, and on, and on top of it for men, uh, you know, if, you if you're carrying student debt, that's also going to diminish your, your plans for having kids. Um, not true for women, but uh, certainly for men. So those are some of the key factors for men. Um, and as I say, it's a little different for women. So what do women think about this versus men? This, this is shocking to me. Yeah, well, uh, for for women, the factors that are linked to uh, you know reduced likelihood of uh, planning to have kids are uh, the more you see your life and career as adding social value, you know, to the world, having helping other people, the less likely it is you plan to have kids. So it's it's almost as if there's a choice between serving the family of humanity versus the family of your own creation with children. Uh, another factor that I think would probably interest you is the issue of personal health. So we ask, how important is health to you? And of course, most people say it's very, 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 very important, but there is some variation there. And back in 92, if you as a woman highly valued your health, it was really very important to you then that was likely, that was going to be linked to your interest in becoming a mother. So health and motherhood aligned. In 2012, what we find is a reversal of that, of that trend so that young women today see uh, motherhood as antagonistic to their own personal health. That is complete victory of marketing over reality. What because do you mean my, by my first book is called The Better Baby Book, and it's about epigenetics and the impact of environment on basically the genes of kids. It's a program that my wife, a medical doctor, and I put together for our own kids to optimize their health and their brains over the course of their lives. Yes. The research is very clear. If you're a woman and you have kids, particularly when you're younger, as in 25 or under, your odds of getting all sorts of cancers drop dramatically. Yet what we're hearing is that women, because of the medicalization of the birth industry, that they actually believe that having babies is going to be bad for them. So to maintain their health, they're going to not have kids. Wow. Scary, right? Uh, when I have, uh, you know, after finding this, I had a number of informal conversations and uh, focus groups with uh, young women about this, including my daughter, who's 20, uh, and is a, uh, a Penn sophomore, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, with some of her friends, and she was not surprised by this result, and the, the attribution that many of the uh, young women who I talked to about this said, uh, you know, it's, it's almost as if they'd rather be fit than pregnant, uh, so that there's you know part of, another part of the uh, cultural changes have been the uh, you know the uh, keen interest in fitness uh, you know above 
above other things in, in life. And so, um, you know, it's, I, I was, it's very interesting what you, what, you, what you and your wife have observed um, and very much consistent with what I see in these data. So those are some of the findings for women. Um, there are some others, but those are, those are some of the key ones. Another one has to do with religion. Um, so we saw a great increase in the number of people who identified as agnostics or uh, atheists. Um, significant rise in, in those numbers and yeah. a decline in, in you know, the traditional religions. And for women, if you identify as ag agnostic or atheist, you're less likely to plan to have kids. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, particularly in the West, where some of the religions tend to promote having kids because it's good for the religion. Exactly. So that and some of the other findings led to the conclusion that um, you know, women today, a number of quotes throughout the book you know, from these young women saying, you know, I, kids would be great, but you know, my career is really important to me, and I don't see how I can take time off. I mean, the amount of time that people are expecting planning to take off with the arrival of their kids is also way down, like by half, uh, you know, in the 20 years. So, you know, the expectation of much more absorption in work and career is, uh, is just on every dimension. Um, very, very clear. One of my relatives used to teach computer science at Stanford. And when she had children, she realized there was no way she could be a, a startup executive in Silicon Valley, which she had been, and be the kind of mother she wanted to be. So she made a conscious and really painful decision to mm. not pursue her career and to take off time and raise her kids. And you know, she's an amazing mother. And I've heard that before. And she kind of gets mad when people say, you can be you know, the perfect mother and hold down a high pressure job at the same time because you'll end up making cuts in both of them and you'll end up with suboptimal results on both sides. Mm. And you know, she decided to make the choice she made. Do you think maybe women are making a, a rational or a good choice when they say, I'm gonna choose between the two because I wanna focus all my energy and attention on either one? That's a, it's a great question, Dave, and I, you know, I hear this all the time, and I'm not sure if I have a, a really good answer. Um, you know, what I've discovered with the total leadership work is that uh, people often have um, opportunities for, for attending you know, to their families and their work uh, in ways that they hadn't thought about before that allow them to give each domain the attention that, that they deserve. Um, but it, it is tough, and certainly one of the things that we saw with uh, the baby bus study was that, um, you know, women today, in contrast to the Gen Xers when they graduated, they're more realistic about just what you spoke to, you know, that, that there's, you, you can't have it all. Um, you know, men are much more likely to feel like they can have it all. Uh, but women are, are more inclined today than they were 20 years ago to say about what makes for a dual career relationship successful. Well, one of us is going to have to um, lean back, and it's probably going to be me. Um, the interesting thing about the findings on dual careers, though, uh, one of the glimmers of hope in this in this study is that men today, compared to their uh, forebears, you know, 20 years ago, um, are much more likely to feel that it takes a 50-50 deal at home for dual career relationships to work. They're more egalitarian. They believe more in the, you know, in the, in the sharing of responsibility in the domestic organization, as it were, uh, than, than uh, 20 years ago. And so there's actually now Compared to 20 years ago, they were very far apart, men and women, in their attitudes about what makes a dual career relationship work, that one person has to give up their career for the sake of the family. Now they're much more aligned as men have become more egalitarian uh, and women have become less so. So now their views are almost identical, whereas wow. 20 years ago they were really far apart. And so one of the things that we're doing on campus now is have it, we're, we're um, giving the book to students and having them read it and then come to talk about in small groups, what do these results mean to you? 
And now let's bring together men and women to talk about what the implications are for our choices going forward. And that's happening all over America. Um, not, not that everybody in America is reading this book or the findings, but the, these kinds of conversations and what we're trying to do with the Work-Life Integration Project at Wharton is to be a catalyst for these you know, new conversations that enable people to explore these questions at a younger age and to talk among themselves about what's possible and what they can do and what it means for how they you know, pursue the next phases of their lives and careers. That, I can't imagine being ready to have a conversation like that in my mid twenties. I, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to touch having kids until I'm at least 35. Like, there's right. no way I'm ready. I'm not interested. I want to kick ass for the next 10 years. Yes. The problem is it's pretty different for men and women because if you decide you want to start having kids at 35 as a woman, that's the year that the risk of all sorts of problems goes up. Absolutely. Uh, we had my own two kids when my wife was aged 39 and 42 and after what? she recovered from being infertile uh, which was diagnosed in her early 30s that was part of our our whole health program but researching all the risks that happened there there's a pretty clear health case to be made for having your kids when you're younger both as a man and as a woman but then you end up making those egalitarian choices around career so you don't get the meteoric rise earlier because you're, quote, distracted by the kids. How yeah. do you get out of this? All right, Dave. So now you're getting into big picture kind of uh, let's think really differently territory. Yeah. Um, so you know better than I, you know, the health research on longevity uh, and how lifespans are increasing. Uh, so, you know, the expectation that my daughter has is that she'll, she'll live into the triple digits, most likely. I do, too. You do what? I have the same expectation, yeah. Of yourself or your children? Myself. Yeah, okay. So that's new. You know, when you it think is. about, you know, the, the traditional lifespans, much, 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 much shorter. And think about all the social and economic institutions that are built around that model of a much shorter life and a much shorter career. You know, there are companies, many, many, many companies that have, you, you must retire at 60 or 65. Two of my top employees are over 60. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm 61 and I can't imagine not working for the next, you know, forever. Right. So, so it's... Um, you know, what the real crunch here is that we've got all these social institutions, the way we educate our students and ourselves, uh, the kinds of policies that we've got regarding child care, leave time for child rearing and other important activities in life, the kinds of pr uh, uh, practices that support, you know, career trajectories that are meteoric starts and then flattening. Those models are all built around a, uh, a, a, um, an expectation of uh, lifespans that are different than what we currently have. And they're built around uh, gender uh, roles, you know, sex roles, that are also no longer valid. You know, single earner father, at, at m mom at home with two and a half kids. That's just not the norm anymore. So what has to shift, and this is, again, big picture, we've got to take small steps towards it, but what, what I see uh, the pressure to, to, to innovate and to evolve is in how we think about careers. So that you, know, you, you take the span and you extend it. You take the span of time when people are learning and you expand that so that uh, a successful life and career you know, goes in waves and it goes for a much longer period of time so that success isn't measured in, you know, have you hit, you know, have you grabbed the golden ring by 30? It's, it's, a, it's a different, slower, uh, you know, what I refer to in the book as a, a slow careers movement, you know, to kind of parallel slow foods and some other slow things uh, where, you know, the pace is more attuned to the way we live now. That flies in the face of an expectation of working 72 hours a week. Oh, I know. No, it's, it's, a, it's a radical vision uh, that I don't think we're going to see very soon. 
However, um, you know, the, the process of cultural change being the slog that it is, you know, it happens uh, one story at a time. As you hear about people who have tried different ways of living and have had success on their terms. And the more we tell those stories, and you know, progressive companies are doing this, telling the stories of people who have succeeded you know, with, with alternate strategies and, and models for you know, how they integrate the different parts of their lives, the more you hear those stories, the more you say, well, hey, Dave did it, and look how he did it, and maybe I could try something like that too. So it's a, it's a, it's a long, slow process, and you're right. It does fly in the face of... Uh, the, the, the expectation that these young people today have about, you know, what they think they need to do to, to be successful. But I think, I think it wouldn't surprise me if those numbers start to go down as more and more people become disaffected with the standard, you know, super fast track model. It wouldn't surprise me too, if what we used to call telecommuting was a part of this. And I've stopped using that term because the assumption that you have to commute is asinine. So all the people that I collaborate with yeah. on, on Bulletproof, you know, on, on making the coffee and just getting the information out there that I'm sharing, they're all over the place. They work remotely. They work from home or they work from wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, a 40 hour work week doesn't make that much sense because the two hours that they would have wasted on makeup or you know, getting dressed and shopping and commuting and putting gas in the car, they get all that back. And if they want to yes. go to the 11 o'clock yoga class, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> like, they get it done. Of course. That, even if you're, if you have kids or you don't have kids, whatever, that kind of model seems to let people work more than 40 hours and still have better work-life balance than they did when they had to be in a fluorescent lit cubicle prison cell. Did that come into your survey? Did you pay attention to that in the overall uh, questions that you asked the people in 2012 versus 2002? Uh, I brought those ideas more into the recommendations um, okay. so that, you know, the... Uh, but the class of 92, 20 years later, we asked a whole bunch of questions about their, um, their work and, you know, their work engagement, the time they spend, uh, and how they spend their time in other parts of their lives. And that's, that's the next study, is to look at, um, like, what those people are doing now and, and how, what, you know, what they said about what they expected, you know, could predict what they'd actually be doing now. But, um, you know, not in, not in the baby bus study. Uh, except in the implications and the kinds of things you're talking about are just exactly what I'm, uh, you know, advocating for in the things that we need to do. It's it's all about you know, from an organizational point of view, from a business point of view, laser focus on results, maximum flexibility in how they're achieved. Uh, that's what's needed. That's my primary recommendation to companies, and it's something we've known for years and years. You got to give people freedom. Of course, it requires trust and good ways of measuring results, you know, that all parties agree on. Uh, so when you say, get it done, everybody needs to know what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's the it? <laughs> yeah, what is it? And yeah, exactly. So it puts a different set of pressures on, on executives like yourself to be super clear about what it is and... Um, and then to invest, you know, the authority with trust in the people who you're, you know, you're asking to get it done, to do it in a way that they see as, um, you know, most most effective from from their point of view. It's a different model. Again, this is, you know, this requires a different mindset for for the, you know, for today's executive. And that's the trend. That's where we've been going over the last couple of decades is towards greater delegation of authority, greater freedom. Uh, more trust, but certainly there are some industries, you know, especially where that just not happening. This would be um, any regulated industry. So if you work in insurance, uh, finance, banking, or government, you're probably screwed because of all the regulatory oversight that keeps you from doing things that normal people do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I'd use the word normal, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're right. Uh, the regulatory environment can be uh, hostile 
to innovation yeah, and, and workplace practices, which is very, 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 very unfortunate. Uh, in my coaching practice, I get a lot of clients out of a hedge fund and just uber high performing money manager types. And you know, they work incredible hours. Yeah. But sometimes you, know, you have to be in this place, you have to be in that place. And you end up beating yourself up for long periods of time. And I find that there's a disproportionate number of MBAs in that mm -hmm. crowd. And they tend to be more type A and they tend to be more attracted to anything that's going to enhance performance mm -hmm. rather than necessarily something that's going to just increase health. Because we all want health, but it's nebulous. Mm -hmm. When you do work, whether it's total leadership style, yeah, or you do your surveys with uh, Baby Bust. How do people prioritize the career success versus health, or how do they even measure it? It seems like they're both of them are kind of nebulous. There aren't quantifiable metrics. Well, no health. Um, you know the health indicators. There's a lot of research on this, and uh, there are some standard metrics that they're subjective. Um, and it's usually on the basis of, you know, compared to people your age, how, you know, fill in the blank, stressed are you? How, how do you think your physical health is, your emotional health? And those turn out to be pretty reliable indicators of um, how you're doing in terms of your, your health. And so I, I do ask people about their health. Um, and it's, it's, again, the, the imagined, the perceived comparison, you know, to a relevant peer group that... Um, gives a good measure of a subjective measure nonetheless but a good measure of how you think things are, are are going for you and so yes one of the first things i do in the total leadership work is uh how satisfied are you at work at home in the community and for yourself which is your mind body and spirit and then how well are you performing in meeting the expectations of the people who matter to you at work at home in the community and your own expectations for yourself I mean, I, I know you know this because you did this uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but, yeah, we're asking directly about that before they do the work of grasping more fully what their values are, thinking really clearly and getting feedback on their future vision, identifying the key people in their lives and having you know, real conversations with them about mutual expectations and then doing these experiments to try to make things better in all four domains without having to sacrifice any one of them and discovering that if you take that mindset, if you, if you put on a new set of lenses and say, all right, yeah. let me see where there's an opportunity to make things better in all four domains instead of having to trade off, well, then your mindset starts to shift. And then, you know, at four months later, we, we, have, we take those measures again of health as well as you know how well you're doing in meeting expectations of the key people around you um and we usually find some improvement uh, but the main thing that shifts is their mindset you know it's how you think about what's possible and that's really what we're, what we're going after so about a half a million people will hear the bulletproof podcast this month and 60 percent of them don't have kids 40 percent of them do and all of them are interested in improving their performance or they probably wouldn't be listening. So what advice would you have to people who are on either side of that kids or no kids, but you really care about their performance? How should they start measuring this if they don't go down the full total leadership, survey mm -hmm. all of my, my stakeholders and my life around me? How should I start thinking about it if I'm new to this idea? Say, well, I guess I should, you know, what's the first step? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are some tools that we, we have for free at totalleadership.org. So if you go to the performance tools page, there are some really simple uh, self-assessments you can do that get you thinking. Um, so, you know, I'll ask you to take the four-way view where you simply look at work, home, community, and self, however you define those different domains, and then take 100 points and divide them up. How important is each domain to you? So some people... 25, 25, 25, 25. For some people, work is everything, 100, 0, 0, 0, whatever it is. And then right next to that is another column where you, you're asked, where do you focus your attention in a typical week or month on a percentage basis? And again, take another 100 points and divide them up. You look at that and say, hmm, where am I focusing my attention relative to what's important to me? 
And then in the third column, I ask you, well, how are things going in each domain? at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself. How satisfied are you for, on a simple scale, subjective, of 1 to 10? And then, last column, how well are you performing in each domain? Imagine I was to talk to the four or five people who know you best in the Bulletproof organization, Dave, and I were to ask them, how well is Dave doing in meeting your expectations? And, uh, you know, what would they say on average on a scale of 1 to 10? So, you know, you, you do that little thought exercise and come up with your best assessment. So that two-minute exercise in looking at the four-way view, what's important, where is your attention, how do you feel internally, and how well do you think other people see you in meeting their expectations, that reveals a lot of information about whether there's alignment between what you care about and what you do, and where the opportunities for improving your satisfaction and performance really are. And the immediate question that, you know, that, that I um, ask you to consider is, what small step could you take now within your control without getting permission from anyone that would make things a little bit better for you and the people around you who matter most to you? And what I have found, Dave, from asking that question of literally tens of thousands of people is that there's no one I have met who cannot answer that question with a... Uh, Hmm, here's something I could do. Uh, you know, it might involve delegating differently. It might involve, uh, you know, changing your schedule some. It might involve, inv you know, bringing people from one part of your life into another part. Uh, it might involve focusing your attention on one person at a time, you know, during a specific time of day. Uh, the, it might involve appreciating people in your life in ways that you hadn't before. There's all kinds of experiments that people do. There are nine different kinds. And you can see descriptions and examples and tips on how to pursue those on our site, along with uh, alumni, such as yourself, talking about the impact of doing this kind of work. So visit the site. There's a whole bunch of free tools there where you can uh, learn some of these things and, and try them. It won't take long. And, and, and uh, that site was totalleadership.org, and we'll link to that in the show notes. If, if people come great. to the site, we'll make sure they can find your work. Now... I do something called biohacking, which means I'm my own guinea pig. And I look at how changes to the world around me or to what I put into my body, food or supplements or electrical currents or whatever else, affect my performance. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that inspired that practice was your class in that you looked at tracking results in a way that was way more quantitative than a typical leadership kind of soft, mushy leadership coach would do. What mm -hmm. made you get so hard-assed about, show me the data, give me a number, versus mm. kind of, how are we doing today? Can we have a hug, sing Kumbaya, you know, walk over the coals kind of thing? Well, we still walk <laughs> over the coals, Dave, but um, <laughs> no, I never did that. <laughs> uh, I think it's a combination of my, uh, you know, uh, the rigor that I, you know, I was trained in. Uh, I'm a PhD uh, organizational psychologist, and uh, I love data. Uh, because I think it helps us to learn. Uh, so I was trained as a scientist. And so this model is very much about a kind of scientific method. So, you know, I call these trials, these, these um, initiatives, these innovations in how you live and work, I call them experiments. And I ask people to think about themselves as scientists and the laboratory is their life, just as you do. Um, and I find that that framing is really valuable yeah. and people require the data. I mean, we know there's research on, uh, that says very clearly that people learn leadership. They learn how to think of themselves as someone who can mobilize other people to get important things done. They learn more about how to do that, uh, not necessarily by walking on coals and singing Kumbaya, but by trying something new that they really care about, that is challenging to them, that stretches them, and surrounding those experiences with two things, support and accountability pressure from other people, peers best, and data that, you know, before, during, and after that tells you how are you doing and what's working and what's not. You can't learn without data. So that's why I'm so passionate and so focused on it because I know that it works and I, I, I believe in science. 
Yeah, data and accountability is a, a shockingly powerful metric or set of metrics. Yes. What are the other things besides those that result in more productivity for people? A lot of people are very, how do I get more productivity? What are the other tricks you may have come across for that? Well, what a lot of people discover in their in the experiments that they try is that there is they're wasting effort on things that don't matter. So one of the discoveries this may have happened with you with the stakeholder dialogues that you know there's three principles: be real, act with authenticity by clarifying what's important, be whole, recognize and respect all the different parts of your life, and be innovative, act with creativity by experimenting with how things get done. So in that middle part, which is really the heart of it, uh, what you do is identify the key people at work, at home, in the community, and then you think through, well, what do they expect of me? What do I expect of them? How well am I doing in meeting their expectations? And you rate that. Getting coaching from people around you on, you know, do you really think you know that, Dave? Or are you just making that up? Or how do you know that? And then you talk to them. And you gain insight about how other people uh, really see you. And what typically happens in those stakeholder dialogues is you go in and you say, okay, Dave, you're one of the most important people in, in my life. And I want to talk with you about how we can strengthen our relationship. Is that something you'd be willing to do? And naturally you say, of course. And you feel probably honored and flattered. And yeah, this is really cool that Stu, Stu thinks of me this way. And it's actually not true, Dave. Although you <laughs> are important to me, you're not the most important person. Um, but you know, just imagine doing that with people who are real, you know, in your everyday life. And and you say, like, okay, so I've thought about it some, and I think these are the four things that I think are most important to you, Dave. And I list them. A, B, C, and D. So I've invested some time in thinking this through. Do I have it right, Dave? What am I missing? And what's likely to happen, if you're like most of my clients and students, is that you're going to come back to me and say, well, Stu, first of all, this is awesome. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Um, and it's great to hear how you think, you know, how you see, you know, what matters to me. And I'm so glad you thought about that. But let me tell you, you know, the first two things, if you hadn't mentioned those, I'd think that there was something seriously wrong with you. So like, yes, of course. But the third and fourth things that you mentioned, I actually don't worry that much about this. Really, Dave? Uh, I've, I've been worrying a lot about whether or not you're worried about those things. And, and you say, well, you know, not that important. Well, tell me why that is. I thought it was. And here's why I thought it was. Uh, these, these things were important to you. Why are they not? Um, and you explain it to me. And so with my relentless curiosity, I then pursue this, trying to take what I call the leadership leap, seeing myself through your eyes. Um and really getting inside your, your head uh, to see what matters to you. I said, well, is there something else that matters to you that I haven't mentioned here? And you say, well, Stu, since you're being so open and non-defensive, and yeah, uh, I'll tell you, there's this other thing. And you tell me. And I said, wow, I hadn't even thought about that. I didn't know that mattered to you. Tell me more about, like, if, what could I do? Uh, and how would, how would my actions help you? live the life you want to live. And so it goes on like that. And that's how many of the conversations go. And so now think about the net effect of that, of that interaction. I went in with these four things in my head, right? Worried about whether or not I was meeting your expectations on these four things. And I come out with these three things. So what does that mean for what I can do differently going forward? It's, going to change your whole direction because you realize that the variables you were optimizing were the wrong variables, which is kind of a huge thing. Some were right and some were wrong. So I can now, exactly, I can now <clears throat> redirect some of my attention and energy to the things that are more more directly focused on the things that matter to you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to waste less time pursuing the things that don't matter to me or to you. And I'm going to become more productive, less focused, less distracted, uh, and more energetic. And that's what we see. Uh, people actually spend less time at work, less of their attention on work, but their performance goes up. That was definitely my experience. Although when I was going through that process, I looked at the amount of energy versus return that I was getting on the relationship domain and I ended up getting divorced. So 
it I makes that. I remember that. Yeah, I remember it was a, many conversations with you about that back then. Yeah, it was it was a stressful time, but it was also really useful to have the data and just realize like this is a bottomless pit for me. I, no matter what I put into this, I don't feel like I'm getting anything back that matches my goals and what I'm trying to get. And to re, to just see the raw hard data and then to have the conversations mm. that you should be having with the stakeholders in your life anyway and realize it's just not there. It was really valuable, maybe tough. So it takes a lot of courage for people to step up and ask the stakeholders around them. Like you're making yourself very vulnerable to say, am I doing a good job? It's way worse than a 360 degree review, which is when the people work for you, tell you whether they like what you're doing and you tell your boss whether you like them. That's a little taste of what happens when you really go out and, and have the face-to-face -face conversations you recommend in the book. How many people just chicken out because it's too scary? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, if you're taking my class, you know, it's a lot harder to chicken out. <laughs> uh, if you're just picking up the book at the airport or something, or, you know, you're listening to this podcast and you start to read and you think, ah, you know, that's a little too much. Uh, it's that accountability and support that you get in a peer network. Uh, so a lot of people read this as like part of a book club, um, or, you know, in a class, there's a lot of classes that use it. And that's where I think it has the most value because it, it is so easy to say, wow, that's too hard. You're, you're totally right. Uh, it does take courage to look within and to see yourself as others see you and to do that exploration. And not everybody wants to do it. Not everybody has the, the time or, you know, the energy or the inclination, which is why, you know, it's, it's not a good idea to do this if you don't want to. But if you see a need and you see potential value, it can be very helpful and enlightening. But it, it does take effort for, for, for sure. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're interested in stepping up. So this is the kind of thing that you need to do, even if it's scary. Because if you don't, you're just not going to hit the potential that you're capable of because you don't have the data. You're flying blind and you're probably flying in the wrong direction even without knowing it. Hmm. It's a good way to put it. So on that note, Stu, there's a question that I ask every guest on the podcast as we wind to a close. Given all the things you've learned, both in your career just and as a human being, what are your top three recommendations for people who want to perform better? If, if someone wants to just kick more ass at life, what are the three most important things you've learned? Lovely question, uh, which I appreciate your asking. I, you know, clearly, the most important thing is something that probably half your guests say, but it, it's just so true. And that is, uh, you, you've really got to have the openness and curiosity and courage to continue to discover what you care about. If, if you're not attuned to that question, what do I care about in life? How, how do I want to leave this world? better. If you're not asking yourself that question periodically, then you're missing out <laughs> on, on, on the joys of, uh, you know, of being a, a person. Um, so I think that's number one, um, that, you know, you've got you've to gotta ask yourself what matters. And then the leadership piece to this is, all right, now what can I do to get support for pursuing that vision of the kind of world I'm trying to create. And to take yourself out of the equation and look to, you know, what is it that the people around me need that I can help them with? And now, and then the third piece of that is, well, how do I then align what matters most to me with what matters to the people around me? And I think therein lies, you know, the, the magic uh, of, and it's, of course, continually evolving and extremely complex, but yeah. knowing what matters to you, knowing what matters to the people around you, and just continually trying new ways of, of aligning those forces, that's, that seems to me to be the, the key to both success and happiness. You've certainly spent a lifetime studying what makes people perform better in, in your work at Ford, your work at Warden. So those are amazing answers, and I appreciate them. Well, thanks for asking and, and for creating this, this, uh, this community. 
of people interested in, in addressing these questions. I think it's fabulous, and I congratulate you. Oh, thank you, Stu. One more time, tell us the name of both of your books and the websites yeah. people should go to to learn more okay. about you. All right, so uh, Total Leadership, Be a Better Leader, Have a Richer Life, and there's tons of information about it at totalleadership.org. Uh, the new book is called Baby Bust, New Choices for Men and Women in Work and Family, and you can learn about that at the Wharton Work-Life Integration Project. So that's the Wharton Work-Life Integration Project at um, worklife.wharton.upenn.edu. Just if you Google Wharton Work-Life, you'll find us. All right, and we'll put all these in the show notes. So if people come to bulletproofexec.com, there'll be a transcription and all the info that they need in order to find all the different stuff we talked about. Well, I'd love to hear from your your uh, community and, and friends. If they have any questions or want to follow up, uh, you can uh, drop me a line. I'm Friedman at Wharton.upenn.edu. I'd love to hear from you. Stu, it's been awesome to see you again after all this time. My Thanks pleasure. for the work you did in the class a long time ago and thanks for being on the show today dave totally my pleasure thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it study just came out showing that the uh, white part of oreo cookies actually activates more opiate receptors in the brain than uh, cocaine does so <laughs> for individuals who are literally addicted to food these are people who are eating till they're vomiting eating till they're sick i mean just this is a bad bad place so I, those people I need to stop freebasing Oreos. Is that what you're saying? 